would be very cool to talk to. Totally. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. a really, really good idea. Because I it's important to me also to, you know, have diversity um mm -hmm. within within the guests as well and um and just have a just a variety of backgrounds and ethnicities and gender what about orientation interviewing and, that that first uh black female uh neurosurgery resident at johns hopkins oh that's a good idea that yeah is a really do you remember good hearing idea. about her yes she like mm -hmm. yeah she might mm -hmm. be really interesting to talk to too she got a yeah. lot of press she might be really good um I also, so this is who I have on. So Rachel Balkovec is the MLB hitting coach. And then um, I have the first uh, female chief of police in the U.S. Oh, wow. Keith Where Penny. is she? She is now in Northern California. She was actually in Portland okay. uh, decades ago. Okay. Um, I have a fighter pilot, which nice. I'm so excited about. That and she's so like, cool. she's in the Th Air Force Thunderbirds, which is their performing you know, they, they do the uh -huh. air shows and, uh, she's like, well, season performing seasons on hold. I'm just <laughs> hanging out. <That's> <laughs> so it's kind of one of those, it, it, you know, I'm like, Oh, why well, gotta like get on it and just, yep. Just knock all of them out. You know, yeah. like who even cares if I have the editing and the post-production piece together yet, which I, I ended up signing up with that, the, the lady in the Philippines to just do everything for five episodes uh -huh. for pretty cheap. And then, and then I still want to, I'm going to learn how to do stuff on my own because after I get an initial season out, then I can, I can decide to take certain things back and I can use them a la carte. Right. Um, and so, uh, and that was only, yeah, how much? Ninety five. Okay, six ninety five for for five episodes, and then she does all the. She'll put together the intro and outro. Um, I found the music, and I have somebody doing the voiceover, so I'll just hand that over. And then all the graphics, the um, three sets of social media sharing uh, pieces with templates from Canva, so I can use them in the future if I want to do that myself. So when you say three set, what do you mean by that? So the for every seconds. episode, you'll get three graphic images that are shareable. Okay. Oh, okay. So they, they kind of do the d design piece for your podcast cover and they, they do the design for it also. Uh -huh. And then they, they create the audiograms and then um, help you set up all the platforms and get you listed on right. Apple all and this stuff. all yep. of all of that, which it's like, I know I could probably learn you how could to totally, do all of that. Just so you know, I did all of it, <laughs> <laughs> but whatever, if you have the money, but it was, then, I mean, it's a pain in the I do. <laughs> it's like, I don't really, but I also wanted to just, just like focus on getting a bunch of interviews done right. and then just, just get something out. And right. I wanted to do it really quickly because I know I can learn all of this and I still plan to, because if this ends up being something good and successful and I, and I continue, then I would probably just do a lot of this stuff myself, Yeah, you know, cause it's you know, fun. I could and it's yeah. fun and I know I'd enjoy doing it. Right. So, so nice. yeah, so that's where I am. I'm excited to see what they create for you. Cause then maybe it'll give me like some inspiration as far as, cause I feel like my yeah. thing, it, it's funny, the guy, the one I sent you, uh, the Pat Flynn guy, like he yeah. has like, he has this like second step thing that I was thinking of signing up for. It's like, okay, so you've been doing this for a while uh -huh. and now what? Like, yeah. how do you get more people to listen? Which is my biggest problem is like, I feel like I spend so much time doing it and then I see, you know, there's like a couple hundred downloads and, you know, it's kind of just annoying. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of getting yeah. that next step of how do you get it out there? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, um, how do you, how's the sound coming through? For Everything you? sounds great. There's no echoing. It sounds really good. It's funny because okay. I don't love zoom, but, uh, I think this sounds good. I've, I've done a couple of things on zoom because I do like the, the East trauma cast we record on zoom mm -hmm. and I, it, but I think that it really depends on like, if you're using a microphone and have good audio, I think it sounds great. I noticed yeah. like when people call in on their phone there, sometimes there's a lot of, uh, echoing and it just, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to edit that shit out, you know, mm, but this yeah. sounds very good. 
Yeah. And they, um, so Bearbeat, who I'm using, um, they, they said, yeah, you can use Zoom and, you know, just make sure that the audio is recorded on two separate tracks and then they mm -hmm. edit that. And, and so. Oh, so yeah. you're recording me on one track and you on another? Uh-huh. Yeah. But so how, it's two, two separate tracks. How, so that's very interesting. Cause I just, mm -hmm. how, did you, how did you set that up? Because I'm it's, asking because I just did a zoom recording the other day. And when I downloaded yeah. it, it was all mixed together. It was all mixed together. Um, yeah. So when you open up the, so I couldn't figure out how to do it from the, the web, uh, the web, you know, the web platform, but, um, like the website platform through the browser, but right. you know how Zoom will open up their app and it'll be a separate window. Right. So when and you I go there, you go into the settings under okay. recordings, and then there's an option where you can uh, record each participant separately and oh. then it'll um, download it to your computer. Oh, see, cause that's what I, oh, that's very interesting. Cause I mm -hmm. really like, I really like that better. Cause that's, mm -hmm. I've been using, um, Squadcast and it all mm -hmm. comes separate and I, yeah. I just really like it. So that's really right. interesting. Yeah. So, and, and that was just from the instructions that okay, she gave nice. me. So oh, that's yeah. Good and that way you can adjust, you know, as you know, I'm sure you adjust the volumes and yep. kind of correct for things. So. I'm just um, shutting, I'm putting my phone on do not disturb. That's one thing I wanted to tell you. I liked the instructions that you sent out. Yeah. Um, but I would say that um, if you should maybe add in there that like when we're recording, if you could, if they're not using their phone, that they should put it on do not disturb. Okay. Because not I'm only make does, notes right now. Yeah. Because not only does the phone not ring, but you know, a lot of our computers are connected to our phone. So even if you yeah. silence your phone, it still ends up ringing on the computer. So okay. maybe adding that would be good. Okay. I'm making notes right now. Okay. Um, um, I'll actually send you, um, when uh -huh. I send you Sarah Becker's thing, I, there's, uh, I got a nice, um, I was on another podcast and I got a really nice email from them. I'll send it to you just so you see another okay. example. They've had okay. over a hundred episodes now, so they kind of know what they're doing. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. But awesome. I really liked that Calendly thing because I haven't used that. I'm going to start using that. It was it great. It works really well. Yeah. So and how did you, how did you incorporate it with Zoom? Because it sent me that, like, does it yeah, ask it, you? It has uh, integrations. And oh, so for you di just. for different platforms? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Oh gosh. You know what? I don't know how to, um, I don't know how to turn this up. So I think that my earbuds or my computer are picking up me saying Siri and then every time or hey Siri and uh -huh. then every yeah see it just did it and, it and every time it does that it comes up on the computer but I don't know if that's from my earbuds or not or from your phone well you can certainly if you go into your Let phone you can disable it you can disable the First of all, if your phone's on do not disturb, it shouldn't be from your phone. No, and my and my earbuds are, are connected to earbuds. the laptop. Yeah. Um, but they're can you go the into laptop. the earbud settings and undo the Hey Siri part? How do I do that? Let's see. Uh, is um, it under system preferences? Because I think it's my computer with the oh. ability to pick up Siri. Wait, okay. I see that. Okay. I'm in system preferences let me go into siri oh it says listen for hey siri on headphones okay that's off <laughs> nice You're getting out all the cakes um, i love it i know that's and that's why oh enable ask siri okay let me turn that off okay siri is just gone nice okay i never use that i never use that on the the lap i'm on my laptop i i never use that on my laptop anyway so yeah. i don't just kind of no use for it. I know. That was, I was so glad that you agreed to do it this weekend because yeah, I'm like, I need to work out all these crazy kinks that I don't know anything about. It's great. So, yeah. All right. Well, um, well, let me, can I, can I run a couple other things yeah, by tell you? Tell me. Yep. Um, so, so, um, got the title and then I have intro and outro and my friend's going to be doing the voiceover. Um, for both of that. And then what I was going to do is record a short, um, a short segment uh, that would be used as my intro for each of the podcasts. You did that, right? 
Right. Well, my intro is actually me kind of introducing it. So I don't have another. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so I was going to do that. Can I read it to you? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, let me, uh, here it is. And then I was going to, you know, I was going to record that and have that every single time. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, and then I would record specific to the episode, my intro of the person and then go to the interview part. Right. Um, okay. So I just wrote this last night. It's totally like a rough draft, but, okay, let's hear. um, Hey, I'm Dr. Nancy and Shipley, your host of the 6% podcast. What's with this 6% business? Well, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I'm a bit of an anomaly being a woman. As I've talked to other women in traditionally male dominated fields, it turns out we have a lot in common with parallel experiences. I hope the 6% podcast shares the struggles and the triumphs of the Renaissance women who thrive in these fields and inspire young girls and women to be the next generation of surgeons, scientists, firefighters, engineers, CEOs, and beyond. Now let's get to it. I love it. Is you that okay? Yes, I love it. You have to interview an astronaut, Nancy. I've That's tried. <laughs> <laughs> Have you? I've, no, I've been sending out no. I've been sending out requests, and um, I I don't know what made been, me just think of that. <laughs> yeah, you know, because that would be amazing. So I have um, I have like a whole. I use Trello to kind of organize all my thoughts and and research for this, which I love. By the way, I don't know if you've I've never used it. used it. I remember you told me about it in Mexico. Yeah, I use it for everything. Um, but for this, I have a guest wish list. And so like I have, um, I have emailed Mae Jemison, but I haven't heard back. Who is um, that? She is the first black astronaut. Oh my God. I That's know. That would be amazing. Yeah. Oh so God. I'm still trying to stalk her. <laughs> it's pretty much stalking wow. people. Um, still trying to stalk her. I I, on a whim, uh, because I'm like, why not? The worst thing that could happen is someone's going to say no. So I uh, emailed Donna Strickland, who's the physicist, who's a recent Nobel Prize winner. Oh, God. She declined. She's too busy. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. At least she wrote you back. Yeah. I think she wrote me back. Um, but let me see who else. I. So I have a commercial airline pilot. I got the fighter pilot. I have this engineer who does a lot of like TV in STEM education, Roma Agrawal. Um, I have the MLB hitting coach, um, a vet female venture capitalist, oh, um, which is cool. Who's the um, um, person, isn't there like um, uh, the football, the football Jen, uh, what is her name? Uh, uh, San Francisco, don't they Jen have? Jen Welter. Yeah. Yeah. So she, um, I haven't found a way to, I haven't emailed her yet. Um, but then there's also Katie Sowers, um, who's the Niners assistant offensive, offensive coach. Okay, nice. Yeah. So I, and, and I actually had a lot of people when I posted on Twitter just say, hey, you should talk to so and so. And some of which were folks that they knew. And right. so they made introductions for me. And some were just like ideas, and which was also super helpful. Right. So definitely so, yeah. need someone in Hollywood, you know? Like I have that. You do? I'm doing that like in, I have two of them. Um, oh, who? Like, so um, this one woman, Kimmy Culp, um, I'll tell you about her. Um, I'm talking to her in like a week. Uh -huh. So she is, she used to be a producer for the Oprah Winfrey show and also NBC and ABC. She started as a journalist um, and she's, uh, negotiated, as I'm looking at her thing, negotiated exclusive interviews for some of the most prominent names in journalism, including Diane Sawyer, Barbara Walters. And then she produced a um, film called Gleason that was on the shortlist for the Academy Awards in 2017. And I, I can't wait to watch this. It's on Amazon Films or Amazon Prime Movies. And it's about an NFL player. His wife is, is this woman, Kimmy Culp's best friend. But uh, the NFL player was diagnosed with ALS. Oh, and wow. this started as him making a series of home movies for his unborn son, who the same time he was diagnosed, he also found out that his wife, after a bunch of infertility treatments, was finally pregnant. 
And so he's still alive. He's pretty debilitated now, but it kind of shows him going from learning about the diagnosis to, you know, being wheelchair bound and his son being born. And it like, I know I'm just going to be like a complete mess when I watch it. So I'm trying to emotionally get myself ready for it. But I've also read that even though it's, it's pretty tragic, it's really uplifting and very positive as well. So it's called Gleason, G-L-E-A-S-O-N. It's on Amazon Prime. I can't wait to watch it. So she produced that. And, um, and then she, let's see. Oh, she used to be the executive director of talent and development at the Oprah Winfrey Network. Wow. That's awesome. So I have her. And then like, I have another lady who, um, and this was just one of my like co-residents who said, Hey, you should talk to these two gals. They're friends of mine that we go way back. Um, this other woman is Vicki White. She's also a producer, director, and a writer. And um, she, I don't remember the name of the film, um, but she had a movie that was gonna, gonna premiere this, I think this month or last month. And because of the, the pandemic that got, that got shut down. Right. Um, and so I, I don't know who she ended up selling the movie to or what, where it's going to be airing. Um, I can't remember, maybe Amazon also, but, um, she's another person who said, yes, I would love to do it. Everyone's nice. like, this is a great time. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Nancy, just so you know, your background is like, it look, it's constantly changing it, colors. Yeah, it is. It is. I'm curious what it looks like when you go back and watch this. Oh, so, okay. I don't know well, if it's you know, like, I mean, it's fine for now, but I yeah. just want you to know. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll go back and watch it and I'll see what yeah. it, see it's what like it a kind of like. like strobe lighting, like going in and out. That's yeah. weird. Yeah. Huh. So, or who oh. knows, maybe it's my computer, but watch the, watch it and see. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah of course. All right. So what do you think? Shall we get started? I'll give you kind of a, a primer on some of the things I'll, I'll ask you real quick, but then we'll just chat. Sounds think, great. I think like just having a conversation like you and I are just chatting is I love it. going to feel most natural, but I'm going to ask you about like where you grew up and just kind of, you know, your, your interesting and unique experience going from naturopath to MD and trauma and who your influential people are, obstacles, you know, either getting, getting to attending hood or now, um, or both and, um, a piece of advice for somebody who wants to do what you want to do, or even just a woman who wants to thrive in a traditionally male dominated field. And then, and then oh, at that the sounds end, great. um, what, uh, you know, if listeners want to find you online where they can find you, like your platforms and, and everything. You, do you know, um, there's this guy who works at the Oregon Clinic, Mark Whiteford. I don't know if you've ever yeah, heard of uh-huh. colorectal surgeon. So, know, I'll, yeah. and I'll share this in the, when you asked me that question, but Mark gave, Mark was my mentor because oh, I was, cool. a, I was a medical assistant in his office in between naturopathic school oh and medical gosh. school. I was a medical assistant with Mark and Um, Paul Hansen and Lee Swanstrom, like these amazing surgeons. I had no idea about anything, you know? So I was like a crazy young Portland woman running around like crazy. And I had all, I was surrounded by all this greatness. But when I told Mark I wanted to be a surgeon, he told me just to remember that I could be a great surgeon and also a beautiful woman. And, you know, I guess in the age of like me too, that's like, wouldn't be a, people could take that the wrong way. But for me, it just no, meant I mean, don't think... like, don't give up that woman side of me that I could still be loving and caring yeah. and fabulous. And, and I like, he just gave me that, that advice has always stayed with me. I so love that. Sharing. Oh, yeah. we I love make sure him. you talk about that. And I will. Yeah. I will. Do, do you still keep in touch? Um, no, I haven't talked to him in a couple. I haven't talked to him in a couple of years. I did just recently see Paul Hansen actually when I was in San Francisco last year for American College of Surgeons. I like the first person oh. I saw was him. Um, yeah, I love those guys. They're and amazing. you know, um, I I run into him. He's there on one of my OR days, so I see him um, at the main OR at PPMC. Uh-huh. So Whiteford. Uh, I don't yeah. know the other two. Um, like I recognize the names, but I may not know them by face. Um, right. Yeah. But Mark I see is Whiteford just, I just knew Mark like 
way back when, when he was first getting started oh. and he just turned into such a rock star. It's awesome. Yeah. That's cool. That yeah, is really, cool. really cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so, oh, I was going to ask you, um, yeah. you know, my, so here's my intro for you and you tell sure. me if that's okay, which I'll not record now, but I'll say today I'll be talking to you and tell me how you want your name to be presented. Um, today I'll be talking to Dr. Melissa Red Hoffman, a trauma surgeon based in Asheville, North Carolina. I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Hoffman at a Women Physicians Conference transformed in Cancun. And I knew within two minutes of talking to her that not only was she a badass, I also <laughs> knew that we would become friends. Uh, Dr. Hoffman might possibly be the only trauma surgeon who started her career as a naturopath. And I can't wait to talk to her about this unique career pivot. So without delay, here's Dr. Hoffman. Yeah, great. And then I, Is that okay? I mean, yeah, it sounds great. And you could decide what you want to do. Like I decided on my podcast, I just call everyone by their first name. Yeah. And, and I think like, is I'll it okay? Them, like I'll yeah. introduce them as Dr. Hoffman, but then I'll say, but in the second sentence I'll say, and red is this, this, and this. And I asked my guests before I'm okay. like, are you okay. okay with that? I just okay. think it's like so much more, like it's more just personal. more of a conversation, right? Yeah. Okay. So then that's, oh, hold on. I just like deleted everything I typed. Oh, <laughs> oh shit. Did you lose oh, it? Oh, no, no, I got it. It's okay. <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> it's like the story of my life. Okay. Um, I'm going to change it as we speak here so I don't right. forget later. Um, that's, that's a good idea. And I'll check with everybody, but I think that's a nice way. And, and yeah, no like, one really cares. <laughs> yeah, because I thought, I was thinking, you know, it'd be weird to, to, you know, I'm not friends with everybody else. I'm, I'm strange, you know, I haven't met them, sure. but it would have been weird to talk to you and be like, so Dr. Hoffman, you yeah. know, <laughs> I, right, I just, well I, I just say at the beginning, like, you know, just the, um, I've just started on my podcast using first names. Are you okay with that? And everyone okay. says yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Okay. So we'll, I'll pause for a second and then okay. we'll just, we'll just start. Awesome. My first, my first go. You got it, girl. All and right. editing is magic. So don't worry about anything. <laughs> Yay. All right. Hi, Red. Hi, Nancy. How are you? Good. I am so excited to have you on today. Thank well, you so much. For, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. That's awesome. And so in my introduction, I told our guests a little bit about you, that you're a trauma surgeon, that we met in Cancun, that you used to be a naturopathic physician before you became a trauma, a trauma surgeon. Tell me a little bit about your path. Okay. Well, I grew up in, um, born in Brooklyn, raised in New Jersey. I always thought I would grow up and be um, a writer. And that changed when I was in undergrad. I eventually started taking some science classes and I had always thought I wasn't good in science, but I realized I could do that. And so I started um, dreaming about pursuing a career as a doctor. Um, I'd been sick when I was in my young 20s and did a lot of work with a naturopath and Chinese medicine doctors. And so I was kind of led down that path of alternative or integrative medicine. Um, I still joke with my mom because I still remember sitting at my aunt's kitchen table and my mother said, are you sure you don't want to be a real doctor <laughs> 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 while I was applying to naturopathic school? Um, but regardless, I think naturopaths are real doctors. I ended up applying and getting into naturopathic medical school in Portland, Oregon. And so I moved to Portland in 1999. I ended up really falling in love, not with naturopathic medicine, but with medicine in general. So some of my colleagues really became excellent in homeopathy or excellent herbal medicine. And I ended up just loving medicine, particularly women's health and transgender medicine. And at some point I realized that doing those, that kind of medicine is sometimes difficult as a naturopath because um, depending on what state you go into, you really don't have a full scope of practice. And so I started thinking, is this what I want to do for my life? At the same time, I um, took some time off, six months off. I went to Thailand and did a three-month yoga teacher training with my yoga teacher. And after that, I went uh, to India. 
So in Thailand, I had had a, um, I was in Thailand during a dengue epidemic and I got dengue fever and I, oh my God, <laughs> I, I really did have like an existential crisis about what do I want to be when I grow up? And then this was followed by my trip to India. And while I was in India, I got to study homeopathy at a truly integrated hospital where medical doctors and homeopaths had been already working together for years and years and years. And so in the morning, I went to homeopathy clinic. And in the afternoon, I got to round with the medical doctors. That was my first real medical experience. And one day I got to go into the operating room. And it was like, no experience I had ever had. So first of all, in America, the operating rooms are freezing, as you know, and you're in all your uh, protective gear. Well, in India, there was a box outside the room filled with flip-flops, which I put on a pair of flip-flops, and I walked into this ridiculously hot room, and I saw my first <laughs> surgery, and I just was like, oh my God, I think I've made a terrible mistake. I want to be a surgeon. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I went back to America eventually, and I told my mom, I think I want to be a surgeon. And she was just so over me at that point. <laughs> um, but I ended up finishing naturopathic school. And um, while I was in the midst of getting ready for graduation, instead of taking my boards, I took my MCATs. And um, during that time, I started working as a medical assistant, and I worked for a group of amazing surgeons at the Oregon Clinic. And I really got to see what a, a surgeon's life looked like firsthand. And while I was doing this, I was applying to medical school. I did not get in my first time around. And I think that was, um, you know, a lesson in really sitting down and going deep and saying, do I really want this? And the answer was, yes, I do really want this. And so I continued to work as a medical assistant um, and I applied again and I got in and I got very lucky. I got to go to OHSU in Portland, Oregon, where I was already living. And it was a lovely transition for me to get to stay in my same community. And so I ended up going to OHSU with the idea that I would be a surgeon and from there kind of have pursued a very interesting surgical path as well. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'll mention that when, when I met you in Cancun, I just loved your story and saw a lot of parallels to my own experience going into medicine as kind of a second career and, and also having some experience in Chinese medicine and acupuncture um, with my stepdad, who is a Qigong master. That's a whole nother story for another day. But, um, you know, going from something where we're looking more at holistic and complementary ways to treat our bodies into something as invasive, like maximally invasive, like surgery, um, is, is such a huge pivot. And so I, I just couldn't wait to hear more about how you got there too, because I feel like our, our paths were a little bit parallel in certain ways. Yeah, it's so. crazy. For me, yeah. I found that I think I would have struggled more with the um, pivot from naturopathic to allopathic medicine if I had chosen something like family medicine or pediatrics where the option to continue to do integrative medicine was there. You know, for me, surgery was so different. Um, but I was able to take a lot of the best of what I learned at naturopathic school, which was really one, always touch your patients, two, always look at the whole picture. I was able to take those teachings and bring them into my surgical world. Because as you know, not every patient we see ends up needing surgery, right? And even for those who need surgeries, I'm also become their doctor and they need me to um, minister to them, not only physically, but also sometimes emotionally and spiritually. So I feel like I kind of got to bring the best of my naturopathic world into my world as a surgeon. So it worked out, I think for me, great. Like I don't regret um, anything, anything of my past because I feel like it made me the surgeon that I am today. That's great. So tell me along this path, who was the singular most influential person who pivoted you towards either going to medical school or going into trauma surgery? 
So I think for going into medical school, a lot of that was my own kind of doing. And in fact, I didn't, I really struggled when I was in naturopathic school to find mentorship. You know, back then, I mean, this was in the early 2000s, the idea of mentorship that we talk so much about now, it wasn't really something that I talked about or read about, but I intuitively knew that I was missing it. And though I looked for it in naturopathic school, I never found it. When I went to, actually, even in deciding to apply to allopathic medical school, I, I already started getting those mentors. And one of them was Dr. Mark Whiteford. I, was, I worked as a medical assistant in his office um, in between naturopathic school and medical school. And he really took me under his wing and really supported my dream of going to medical school. And then when I matriculated into OHSU, I had so many great mentors. I think one of the best was Dr. Scott Fields. That makes me like, um, it makes me weepy to think about him. Um, he was, um, God, he's larger than life man. He was a family medicine doctor, which is funny because I knew I didn't want to go into family medicine, <laughs> but he was my, um, as a first year medical student, he was my preceptor. I was in his clinic every single week for a year. And he really just supported my dreams and supported me as a person. In fact, I've often been told in my life, maybe you have too, Nancy, that I'm too much, you know, too loud, <laughs> too, too big, all this. And he was a big man. He was big, a physically big man. He wore cowboy boots in the OR. That was the first person I ever saw do that. He had a big personality, big opinions. Um, and was very well respected, but you know, there were people who didn't like him because they thought he was too big. And I remember someone told me that I was being too big and he said, you know, just be you like you are who you are and you're okay. And just having that support so early in my career was just really awesome. So he was one of my great mentors. And then I had a great trauma mentor, Dr. John Mayberry, who, um, he became my research mentor and we did a great project together and I still talk to him and, and see him at conferences and he too just really supported my dream. So I felt um, OHSU was just an amazing experience for me. That's wonderful. Yeah. Before we were, uh, before we started the podcast portion, we were getting caught up and, and chatting and you told me about something Dr. Whiteford said to you. I would love it if you would share that. Sure. So when I told Dr. Whiteford that I wanted to be a surgeon, he looked at me and he told me, don't ever forget that you can be a great surgeon and still be a beautiful woman. And I was sharing with you, Nancy, that I think in the day, you know, in these days of the Me Too movement, that that might be perceived as something you wouldn't say to someone. But for me, what I took from that was don't give up what makes me, me, meaning that I can still be nurturing and loving and kind, and I can still be fabulous and show up like you show up with high heels and, um, <laughs> I don't wear lipstick, but lipstick and beautiful clothes and like just maintain whoever it is you are and still be great in the operating room and great with your patients. And so he told me that probably in 2005, so about 15 years ago, and I still remember it because it just meant so much to me. I think that is, is really good advice. Um, I, I speak a lot about how we need to just embrace who we are. And you and I, even as women surgeons, can be great surgeons technically without becoming hard about it. Um, and, and sometimes you do see that happening in, with women in surgery. And sometimes women will feel like they cannot still embrace the feminine parts of themselves uh, in being a surgeon. And so we often are we often feel like we have to have this hard protective shell and and while there are a lot of demands in being a surgeon and especially for you being a trauma surgeon and in the situations that you're in it does not mean that we have to sacrifice who we are and sacrifice what it means to each of us as being women um, and so i do find that advice from dr whiteford pretty pretty poignant um, so sorry um 
I'm going to pause for one second, Red. Okay. And then we'll pick back up because Sounds my great. husband and my son are screaming at outside each other? the room. <laughs> at, yeah. And I need to tell them to stop. So I'm going to go tell them that Do it. it's too much. And then we'll, we'll come back. And it's so distracting. Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay. Well, that's another thing you learned that you really need to tell them they can't make any noise for an hour. The thing is I did. <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm going to start recording now. It, please don't come in the room. And, and so like, like, as I was talking to you, they walked in the room next to the closet with my husband and my son on his shoulders and they waved at me. <laughs> so Anyway, so there goes the uh, there goes the uh, video recording. Of it. I can still use snippets of it. Use snippets? That's fine. That's funny. I was like, I am going to kill you guys. That's actually very funny. I'll, I'll, I'll edit it out. Okay. Yeah, I totally got distracted. Um, okay, let's get back to it. I think I want to get back into. Um, mentoring, maybe talking a little bit about mentoring and um, men as allies in a way, oh, yeah. the he for she movement, um, and just kind of get your take on that. So, And then can we talk for... a little bit about palliative care too? Absolutely. Do definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we'll do, the, we'll talk mentoring, he for she, and then we'll go into palliative care. I'll ask you about that. Great. Yeah. Okay. So let me just think about this. Thank yeah. God for editing. Um, so Red, when I asked you about your mentors, a lot of these mentors were men. And, and uh, you know, I don't think there is anything remotely wrong with that. Um, a lot of my own mentors in orthopedics were men, and, and it just is naturally how it happens when you are in a male-dominated field. But I personally have been very grateful for having male mentors who never once questioned whether I'd be able to do this as a woman, right? And so tell me a little bit about your take on the whole concept of he for she or men as allies for women in surgery. So I will say I've been very lucky. I feel like the um, male surgeons, and also I have a lot of um, male mentors in palliative medicine as well. I have not, thankfully, um, been subjected to any sort of discrimination by them. I have always felt very supported by them. Um, certainly, I will say in general in surgery, there is a lot of, or sometimes, depending on who you're with, there's a lot of bantering back and forth. And some of it, it's true. Some of it for some people may... Um, uh, may be taken as um, inappropriate, but it, for me, I just have a like silly personality. And so I've really not been that offended. I think, you know, there's a lot of um, pressure in surgery. And I think we do blow off steam in different ways, either by very, um, by inappropriate humor, whether that humor is um, sometimes quote unquote, sexually inappropriate or inappropriate in a way like joking about death. I mean, people need to decompress. I think, you know, if, if the tone of the room, if everyone's okay with it, then it, sometimes that happens. And, you know, I understand that it's a slippery slope and that's probably a whole nother talk. But for myself, I have, I have not been, um, subjected to that. I will tell you the whole he for she movement. I've actually been, what it's made me aware of is not so much what I have been or not been subjected to, but what some of my younger male residents are subjected to. I actually work with a resident right now who is, um, I actually have told him this. I've never been around someone who has garnered so much attention from um, females before. I, I've actually never seen this. He is a very classically um, handsome young man, and it is um, 
it's actually almost ridiculous, the comments that I get, whether he's in the room or not in the room. And so I've become more um, protective of him. You know, I'll say, yes, that's fine. But in reality, like this is a young man who's your surgeon. Like he just did your case with me. And so it's been a good lesson for me too, that like um, no one needs to be being objectified. <laughs> Especially yes, after true. they've just operated on you, you know, so right. it's just kind of opened my eyes in all different ways. Right. It definitely goes both ways for sure. But I, I, I will, I, oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I will say that I'm very lucky. I work in a group. There's uh, 13 members of my group right now and six of us are women. Um, so I work with seven great men, like just there's really no gender divide at all, except for the fact that perhaps the women, some of the women tend to be more um, lovey. You know, there's some of us are just more huggy. I mean, maybe that's like a female trait, but beyond that, it is just the most like equitable uh, group that I could ask for. That's really wonderful. I, I think I similarly have had um, fairly good experiences. And, and, you know, and I wonder if like you, some of it is, is being a being in a good environment, but also be knowing which battles to fight, right? And you got to pick your battles. There are going to be some things that are said where, you know, if you really wanted to be nitpicky about it, you could, you could call it out every single time, right? Um, but I ask myself when I encounter something like that, what good will come of it? And so I have taken to more writing and speaking about it um, on my own platforms and drawing attention to it to educate more. Right. Um, and I think a, a lot of times education uh, is important in people knowing when to be sensitive and when not to. But, but I agree with you. I think that in the OR, we have to sometimes find ways to to be able to release some of that pressure and similar to you i think humor is one way to do it humor and, and for me hip-hop <laughs> i'm <laughs> gonna listen to the hip-hop I'm, I'm an 80s <laughs> hair band person myself <laughs> which is it's, it's similarly awesome i I, so, I actually can i ask you a question real quick yeah, i'm of course. i'm wondering as when we're talking about kind of males and females in the or one thing that i have found and that my female colleagues and i talk about a lot is that we do tend to i think get treated a bit more harshly by some of the or staff um, I've noticed some of the things that have been said to me would never have been said to some of my male colleagues, particularly my older male colleagues, some of the kind of snarky comments. Um, and, and so that I find frustrating, you know, kind of the unwillingness to accept that I too uh, am highly trained, that I too am capable, that what I'm saying um, is correct. Mm -hmm. and that I have found to be a real struggle, particularly as a, as a newer attending. So I feel like it's the new attending part that you're getting hazed. And then on top of that, I'm getting, I feel like a little more hazing because I'm a female. I'm wondering if you've gone through that as well. I think I have maybe to some extent, not very often. And, and perhaps that's because I'm, I'm fortunate to be in a place where, where I haven't been treated like that much at all. Um, if anything, it's a little bit more subtle and perhaps it happened a little bit more earlier on, but I've been at my hospital now for almost nine years. And so uh, I think people are just used to working with me at this right. point. So I, I haven't had as much of an issue. I do think that sometimes I will encounter, you know, if it's, if, if it's up to, uh, excuse me, if it's, if it's a matter of, say, bumping a case or delaying a case, you know, I think in general, and this, this I don't even think is a male-female thing, I, I think when, when surgeons advocate for their patients and say, hey, look, no, we need to go now, um, we can't afford to wait two hours or five hours and get, get our case bumped lower um, on the list, it, it, I think it's the squeaky wheel that gets the grease. 
and yes. and it, it's not a male female thing and and maybe i'm not as squeaky sometimes and so you know i think that my colleagues in the or tend to perceive me as as nice um and maybe that does happen a little bit more to me than the person who's always ranting and raving but that's also not me you know right um but there there is that balance of being able to identify when you really need to speak up to advocate for your patient and when uh, it's unacceptable to be treated unfairly and for your patient mm -hmm. to be treated unfairly in those circumstances so you mentioned that you are also very heavily involved in the palliative care side of medicine. Can you tell me a little bit more about how that part of your career had come to be and, and tell me why you are so interested in palliative medicine? Sure. So when I was 19 years old, my dad was killed. He was killed actually by a terrorist in Egypt. Oh my God. He was on a business trip yeah. to Egypt and he was shot to death. And wow. I think it taught me, I mean, it changed my whole life personally and professionally. And it taught me and made me very interested in grieving and in the process mm -hmm. of grieving. Um, and so when I went to medical school, I was obviously still thinking about life and death and grieving a lot. And like I said, I, I was so lucky to go to medical school in Portland, Oregon. So Portland is the, um, well, Oregon was the first state to um, pass the death with dignity law that allows um, medically assisted suicide. And OHSU was the birthplace of the POST form, which is Physician Order for Life Sustaining Treatment. And so palliative care and end of life care were very much integrated into my medical training. So I came with this interest and then it really was nurtured while I was at OHSU. And I got to, I did a month long rotation with the palliative care team that really taught me so much about communication and symptom management. When I went to surgical residency where I trained, there was no palliative care team. And so one, I saw a great deal of suffering that I think could have been avoided by good palliative care. But two, I got to practice a lot of primary palliative care skills because there wasn't a team to offer that. Mm -hmm. And so it became clear to me that I really wanted to make this a part of my career. It also became clear to me that if I wanted to be taken seriously, I needed to get further training. And so after training, doing my training as a general surgeon and then as a trauma critical care surgeon, I did another year um, doing hospice and palliative medicine. And I was very lucky where I trained as a hospice and palliative medicine fellow, I was able to stay there. And so now I work there as a trauma surgeon. And I also integrate palliative care into the care of my patients, particularly those in the ICU. And then I also work as a hospice attending uh, a couple days a month doing, you know, end of life care. And mm -hmm. for me, um, doing palliative care with trauma and emergency general surgery, I mean, it makes so much sense. My patients need that care. Most of my trauma patients are older patients who fall. And so many of them have fallen many times. I mean, obviously you as an orthopedic surgeon take care of those as well. And so talking about what are the goals of care for this hospitalization and moving forward is um, so important. So I, I think it's a great combo. I love it. And you're clearly so passionate about the palliative care component of your practice that you started a podcast on it, right? I did. I have a podcast that's available on Apple and other podcast um, places. It's called the Surgical Palliative Care Podcast. And in that podcast, one, I my goal is to interview the founders and the leaders of the surgical palliative care movement, but also to talk to um, leaders in the field of palliative care in general. And my hope is that surgeons of all um, types will become more comfortable doing primary palliative care. So learning how to have good goals of care discussions, learning to talk about code status, learning some good symptom management so that we can all take better care of our patients. And I'll share with the audience that um, we're talking to each other on Zoom so that we can see each other. And, uh, and you podcast, you started podcasting well before uh, I did. And I was admiring your microphone setup. I got on and I said, ooh, <laughs> look at that. Well, fancy, yes. <laughs> Very fancy, yeah, Thank you. yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I'm curious, 
through your career as a trauma surgeon attending, and and I also want to share with our audience that uh, you know that may be kind of easy lingo for us, but an attending means that you've finished medical school, you have finished residency in which you're a doctor, but you're still kind of a junior doctor and you're learning, and now you're in full practice. That's what an attending is. So as a trauma attending, once you've got there, um, tell me about one of your biggest obstacles, or tell me about a time where you feel like you had a, a major failure, but more important than the failure how did you get back up? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I will say, my boyfriend's in the other room. He could probably attest to this. My first year as an attending was, I think, the hardest year of my life. I mean, I could, I could not believe the amount of anxiety that I felt. I just, I couldn't believe it. And this is coming from someone who, you know, has a good, I feel like good self-care practices and yet nothing I had done in my life could like prepare me for what I was feeling. Um, early on, I did have a, a, I mean, I had several complications early on. One that I'm just like remembering that makes me just feel anxious thinking about it. And what I learned from it was I should have called for help. And so what it mm -hmm. taught me was, I mean, now I just I have a very low threshold to call for help. And a lot of times that help is, I just need someone's eyes in the room. I, I mm -hmm. really, I don't, I, a lot of times I don't even need someone to scrub into the case. I just need another set of eyes to be like, you're on the right track. Or I'll often say, can I just run this by you? This is what I'm thinking. And you know, that is, um, very, it's scary in any world. It's certainly scary as an attending, a new attending surgeon to be saying like, uh, I need help here. But in the end, it's not about me. It's about the patient. And that's truly, I mean, in the end, that, that is really all that matters. It's like whoever can get this patient off the operating room table um, in the most, uh, in the quickest and the most safest way, that's all, that's all that matters. But, you know, it does take, uh, you have to just let go of your ego to do that. And also just know it's okay. Like yeah. then I started talking to people more and I realized, oh, a lot of people call for help. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. so blessed in my practice that like, I love all of my partners and I just feel like I can always call them. I just never feel bad calling them. I've never been met with anything but a willingness to help. And I'm, I'm just so grateful for that. And so I would say, regardless of whatever you do in your world, whatever field you're in. It's just who you work with, we know, is like the most important thing. Right. And, and I, I have to agree with that. I, you know, it's, it's hard to get over that hump and to wonder if you're going to be perceived as weak or not as smart or not able to think on your feet when you have to ask for help. But it's okay to do that um, in any field, but especially in medicine, it, you don't always have all the answers. And sometimes having another, another set of eyes, another brain involved can help you think outside the box and help you see a new perspective. Um, sometimes I'll double scrub with one of my partners, which is really a rarity, but I always find that so fun because you have two orthopedic surgeons in the room. And even though I may be assisting on a, a, a case that is not something I normally do, my, I have a foot and ankle partner, I have a total joints partner, sometimes just having another surgeon in the room it has so much value oh, yeah. um, and I, just gives you a new perspective. I had an experience recently. One of my attendings from residency has... Uh, moved to North Carolina and has joined my practice. She's now my office mate. This is a woman who I'm, like I tell her, she literally taught me how to think. Like she is the one who I would want at the end of the bed in the middle of the night so I could just kind of think out loud and she could correct me. And so, you know, she joined my practice and recently she called me, we were both on that day. She called me from the operating room. She's like, hey, Red, this just happened. What do you think? And I was able to, I was amazed that one, this person called me for help and two, that I was able to like spit out an answer that was a good answer. And that I don't know if I was the one in the operating room, if I would have been able to think that, but I was like, oh yeah, you just do this. And so it was just, um, such an amazing experience 
to realize like everyone needs help and it's totally okay. And we all have something to offer. So it was, it was very cool. I told my co-residents like, oh, I really feel like I'm growing up, you know? Yeah. That's, that's one of those great moments, isn't it? In yeah. Medicine. Yeah. yeah. I want to ask you if you had one piece of advice for a woman who hopes to, whether it's in medicine or in surgery or hopes to just thrive in any male dominated field, what would that be? Truly figure out what you want and go for it. So for me, this idea of combining trauma and palliative care, there's a few people in the country who would do it, but I, I didn't know any of those people. I didn't, I, I kind of had an idea of what I wanted my life to look like, but there was no one around me who could really guide me in that. And so, I mean, now we can just go on the internet and figure out who's doing what I need to do. Um, figure out what you want figure out who's doing it and then get in front of them, whether it's getting in front of them via email or showing up to meetings. I mean, I showed up to the same, I invited myself to this same meeting for like years. And finally I was like, Oh, I have a seat at the table because I just kept asking, can I come? <laughs> um, and it's just, it's get in front of these people and say, um, can you help guide me? Because when people love what they do, they are so willing to help other people get there as well. So I think that would be my advice. And then the other advice in general is just show up because I'm someone who I don't always like getting out of bed or it's very overwhelming when you go somewhere and you don't know anyone. <laughs> um, but I would say the magic happens when you show up because like that's, I mean, what's probably 90% of it is about showing up. I love that. That's, yeah. that's really, really good advice. And so we talked a little bit about your podcast already, but where can the listeners find you online if they want to know a little bit more about you? Sure. So I'm active on Twitter at red, like the color M D N D. So M D for medical doctor and then N D for naturopathic doctor. Um, I also have another Twitter site that focuses on surgical palliative care. And so you can find me there at Surge Pal Care. And then lastly, if you want to find my podcast, it's called the Surgical Palliative Care Podcast. And I would say, even if you're not in medicine, you can learn so much about good communication skills, about talking about these end of life issues that I think are germane to all of us because unfortunately, Unfortunately, or fortunately, we all have an expiration date and we just all need to deal with that. So I hope that even if you're not in medicine, you'll take a listen to that as well. Thank you so much for being on with me today. Thank you, Nancy. That was so much fun. You're awesome. Thanks. All right. That was what great. You, yeah. I don't know. What do you think? I think it was... <laughs> So I think it was really good. I'd say that, you know, you got stuck a couple of times. I don't I know. know if you, so, I mean, I don't.